Hello everyone, today we're looking at a cool Dan Huff concept, Jangle Parts. Uh, suppose you get in a session and a producer comes and says to you, look we need a kind of a part that threads that all together. We don't want to use a lot of synthesizers, but we need something to just tie it together, make it sound maybe a little more pop. Um, at that point, usually I'll, I'll kind of go to what I call Jangle Parts. One really cool thing about this device is that if you have another rhythm guitar track in your chorus, let's say it's a heavier tone with some power chords, this can help to dissipate some of the heaviness. And I'll show you what I mean now. So I'm gonna show you just the rhythm guitar part from the little extract at the start. And then I'm gonna play it again with the jangle parts layered over the top. And you'll see that you can get away with having what's really a pretty kind of heavy rock guitar part on there. But as soon as you put this jangle part over it, it somehow becomes more acceptable as a kind of pop arrangement. So, Let's talk about the theory side of things for a minute. Jangle parts usually comprise of very simple chord types. More often than not, we're talking about triads, so major, minor, sus2, and sus4. Occasionally, you do get guys like Michael Landau who use some slightly more dissonant sounds, but this isn't necessarily that he's doing anything too crazy, it's just that he's using close intervals. So with something like this, <laughs> What he's doing is putting two close intervals into the same chord. So our standard major triad is comprised of the first, the third, and the fifth degree of the scale. And if we have a, let's say, a sus four chord, then we replace the third note scale with a four. So we have the first degree, the fourth, and the fifth degree. And what Mike will sometimes do is put the third and fourth in the same chord, which by itself is Wow, quite a dissonant sounding interval, but when we put it in the context of the chord itself, actually sounds quite nice. Anyway, I digress, that's another lesson in itself. So let's kind of jump into the background theory stuff on jangle chords. Now, as I mentioned previously, a lot of these parts tend to be quite small voicings, so three, sometimes four notes. But the key to making them sound right is something called voice leading, and this is what we're going to talk about now. Essentially, all voice leading is, is when we are looking to relocate the notes within a chord to be as close as possible to the chord that preceded it and that follows it. So we're looking to essentially move, physically move as little as possible from chord to chord. And this creates a really nice flowing sound, which I'm going to demonstrate in a little bit. So all I really want to do with this next brief segment is to clear up some of the terminology as we use it. So essentially, any chord that you play has been generated by a process called harmonizing the major scale or harmonizing A scale. It doesn't have to be the major scale. And what this looks like is if we take the key of C major, for example, a C major scale has got these seven notes in it. C, D, E. F, G, A, B. I'm enjoying having my chorus sound today, I'm indulging. Um, and we can also number these intervals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which is how we're gonna be talking about chord types. Now, how we go from scale to chords is very simple. This quite intimidating sounding term, harmonizing, simply means that we're gonna do this. We take the first degree of the scale, we skip the second and we take the third. So we have, that's the first and third degrees of the major scale. We're gonna skip the fourth and we're gonna take the fifth. So the three notes we have are, if we put them together, that's where a major chord type comes from. And if you repeat that process from each degree of the scale, so same scale, but you do the same thing starting on the D and then skip a note, take a note, etc. If you repeat that, you'll end up generating 
seven different chords and this is what we deem as being the diatonic chords within a key which just means chords belonging to a key so we know how to generate now what we would call a root position chord which is one built using the root the third and the fifth in that order this would be our kind of recipe for making a major chord so to try this out i'm going to take a very simple chord progression it's going to be the hey joe chord progression c major g major um d major a major and i'm going to try and play something jangle party using just this root position shape. We're gonna see how, how close it gets us, okay? So here we go. Mm, okay, it's okay, but really it hasn't got that right sound yet. It's got some of the stuff going on. We're doing broken chords, we're doing smaller voicings, but it just, there's too much movement at the moment. We can hear the whole shape picking itself up and departing to the other end of the fretboard. The movements are too great and it's, it's, not, it's not got the sound of the example we heard earlier in this lesson. So this is where inversions and voice leading comes into the equation. So now we know how a basic major chord is formed from the first, the third and the fifth degree of the major scale. That forms our root position chord, right? So we can play our root position chord in a few different places on the fretboard. And it's the same exact structure. We're just starting it in different octaves and stuff. But the thing with inversions is that we can actually, now we know our notes, now we know it's one, three, five, and we know that in the key of C, that's gonna be um, C, E, G. It means that we can rearrange those notes any way that we like. So to give you an example, that was one, three, five. But I could have uh, three, five, one, or I could have five, one, three. One, three, five, uh, five, one, three, three, Five, one. There's loads of different places we can find those notes and we can, we can arrange them legitimately any way we want and it's still gonna sound great. Now this leads us into voice leading, which is something which um, we can apply to chord progressions. And I'm gonna show you kind of how this looks on the guitar now, the easiest way is to just show you. So. The first chord now, hey Joe progression with C major, and we're gonna play it where we learnt it here, okay? Now, my next chord in the progression is G, and if I think about a G scale, then my one, three, and five of that chord are G, B, and D. Those are our chord tones from the scale, okay? Now, what I'm gonna be doing is, looking at my C shape and trying to visualize where the notes of my new chord, which is G, are gonna be situated as close to this area as possible. So let's go through it together. To start off with, well, I've actually got a G note already within this chord. The third fret of the E string is a G, so that is that one taken care of. Now, if I look at, let's say, this note in my C chord, which is currently a C, for my G major chord, I need G, B, D. So if this is C, my B is just gonna be one fret lower. Now, if I look at the note on the B string, I've currently got an E, and for my G major chord, I need G, B, D. So to find a D note, I'm gonna go from E down two frets, okay? Now we've got our G triad and we've moved not much at all. We haven't had to move our hand a bit. We've only had to rearrange two fingers. Okay, if I were to do the same thing with the rest of the progression, we might get something like this. Okay, so I've got through four chords, and whereas previously I was up and down the fretboard like nobody's business, I've now done this in such a way which is localized to sort of a, a, a couple of frets really. 
And this is a big component of getting the sound of jangle parts. Now, if I try applying some picking to this chord pattern now, so all I'm doing is breaking the chords up. What you'll often find people like Dan do is keep a pretty kind of consistent pattern. It's not really random. They'll tend to find something that works and then apply that through the whole progression so that it's got more of a sense of structure. So if I do that, if I kind of borrow the sort of picking pattern from um, earlier on in the lesson, then we'd have this sort of thing. Okay, we're getting a bit closer. Now, there's a couple more things we can do here to get it a bit closer to Dan. Um, I mean, the first is that you can roll this concept out to anywhere on the fretboard. So if I were to start here instead, Exactly the same idea. I just found a starting point and then I went through my progression trying to find um, the most localized version of those little triads as possible and, um, and kind of just going from there. Now, the reason why these are often kind of situated on the top three or top four strings is because this will mean they stay out of the way of the other stuff going on in the track. So if you've got power chords chugging along, this is going to be in a different enough register that the two things are not going to be kind of muddying up the same space within a mix. You're going to have nice separation. It's going to make the whole palette of guitar stuff sound broader and bigger. You can pan stuff out. I'll show you some tricks with sounds later in the lesson, but um, this is like, it's such an effective arrangement device. Now, a couple of other things you can do once you've got the basic uh, kind of idea with this sort of stuff is to start changing the chord types up a little bit. So a very simple way to do this that makes a big difference is just to bring in sus chords. So we talked earlier about how a root position triad is one, three, five, and how sus chords still have the intervals one and five, but the three is replaced with either a two or four, i.e. the second degree of scale or the fourth degree of scale. So for example, if this is root position C, this would be a sus4, this would be a sus2. Now, sus2 is a sound that you'll be hearing a lot of in this type of record. So even if we change the first chord to just a C sus2, ah, right, we're starting to get there now. You don't have to do it for all of them, even if you just change one or two of them, it's quite effective. Okay, so I just changed out the first chord and the last chord for sus twos, and it's brought us a little bit closer again to that 80 sound. Okay, let's talk about tones for just a second. So, full disclaimer, I'm using my Kemper at the moment. Um, my amp is in the shop, and the shop is in lockdown. So, yes, I'm gonna be doing this for the foreseeable. <laughs> Um, but the cool thing is that I, I can just as easily show you how to build the components of it. So to begin with, we have a clean platform. That's completely dry. And EQ wise, it's not very guitar-like. I've really upped the treble and the presence because I'm going for more keyboard. This is not necessarily the sort of sound that you'd want if you were just sitting playing at home. This is more designed to fit into a track. So I have, um, a little bit of mids boosted, but mostly it's treble and presence, which have been upped. And this is just a clean divided by 13 profile with no gain, no broke up on it whatsoever. The next thing we're adding is compression. So I've gone for a very, very aggressive type of compression here, which is sort of designed to mimic the old DBX rack compressors. <laughs> So there's a real kind of snap at the front of the note. Um, generally speaking here, we're going for, if you have any sort of EQ switch on your compressor, you're going for brighter sounds, you're going for faster attacks, and you're going for quite aggressive compression settings, really. Or 
also means it will sustain for a long time. Next up is chorus. So annoyingly, this is like my favorite chorus pedal ever. Um, it's made by my friend Luca, who um, they now go under Red 7 devices. Um, they used to be called Shiva Audio devices back then. And this is killer. This is an absolute kind of tri-stereo chorus in a box pedal. It sounds absolutely fantastic. But for some reason, um, my Kemper doesn't like it. I, I, I'm not a fan of running pedals into my Kemper so much stress. I tend to just use what's in there. So I couldn't really do it justice today. However, I do have a full demo video of that on my channel um, further back and you can check it out there. So for now, I am cheating and I'm using the chorus that comes in the Kemper. It's just a vintage chorus. Um, what you have to do is really listen for the sort of rate settings that are being used on these records. You're basically looking for how fast or slow the wobble is. And if you close your eyes, you can kind of visualize it and that's really what you're striving to match. I have a fairly high mix setting on this as well because I am going for full 80s keyboard cheese. Okay. Um, and you can recreate this with any sort of chorus pedal. It's just that some are better than others at it. And I have no affiliation with those guys. I just think they're awesome. I, I paid for that pedal. I just have become friends with Luca since because he's a cool guy. Um, but it is a brilliant tri-chorus pedal, so check them out if you have a chance. Next up is delay. So I noticed Dan doesn't go too crazy with this, so I've kept it pretty minimal as well. It's just a, um, a digital delay, darkened a tiny bit. And it's really just to give them those nice tails. It's not really interfering too much with the um, body of the sound. Last up is reverb. Um, now with this one, I've gone for quite a big sounding reverb. But it's been darkened quite a lot, which means you can mix it higher. If you have a bright sounding verb, you can't get away with mix settings of sort of 50% and over because it starts to get too sort of surf sounding. Um, however, if you can manipulate the reverb and back off the high end, you can generally mix it a lot higher and have much longer tails so that it kind of, your sound sits on this pillow. Now there's one final trick that I did in the demo at the start, and that is something to do in post, which means when you've actually recorded your guitar in. Um, within Logic and with um, probably with other DAWs as well, um, you have something called sample delay. So this is within the delay settings, but it's one where you can set a very, um, very, 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 very short delays. So we're talking like 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, um, and you can, use this plugin in mono or stereo. So one trick that I do with these sounds is I will send my guitar sound out on a bus and then on that bus, I will put a stereo sample delay and then set each side at a slightly different um, millisecond. So one is usually 10, one is usually 20 or 25. And my theory was this was to kind of recreate the old um, kind of micro pitch shifting that used to be used in the old Eventide rack harmonizer units. And again, it kind of does that. It, it produces a similar sort of effect within a mix. So check that out too. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I appreciate that without us establishing like a kind of base level theoretical foundation, um, some of these things are sort of tricky to teach because I'm never sure whether somebody's sitting there going, yeah, yeah, I know this, or whether they're going, oh, I don't know this, um, which is why I'm working on this series of um, kind of guitar-centric theory concepts and just generally the more feared kind of music theory concepts. This is part of my job. Uh, I teach as module leader for the degree course at BIM Birmingham, which is kind of like the English equivalent of um, MI. I guess. So I'm kind of happy to start trying to shed some more light on these subjects with people. That's it for now though. Um, please, if you enjoyed this video, you know the deal, like and subscribe, I really appreciate it. And um, if you're feeling 
super, super cool. I now have this um, buy me a coffee thing, which is just like, if you want to, you can do it. It's sort of like Patreon, but less formal. Um, just to kind of give me the ability to keep making these videos. Obviously, nobody's gigging at the moment. So my aim is to start trying to put out weekly content anyway. Um, but any kind of support from you guys would really, really help. Um, so I appreciate it. All right, gang, uh, stay safe. Have a great week. I will see you hopefully next week. Bye-bye.